Hey, once again, this is Dave Lewis from Apologetics from the Attic. Welcome back to our study through the book of Romans. And I have to tell you, preparing for this has been a challenge, more of a challenge than I realized, because I want to make content that is relevant for both the new believer, the new Christian, the person who wants a simple explanation of the book of Romans and how it applies to their life practically and what things they can, applications they can make. But I also want to appeal to someone who wants the deeper study to go through some of the commentaries and go through some of the things. And I've found, you know, that balance is difficult. And that's why Bible colleges and seminaries have, generally, they have basic introductory courses to things and then they have advanced you know, whatever, 200 level, 300, whatever the thing does. So <clears throat> what I decided to do here, I'm going to pray, and then I'm just going to walk through the text that we're going to study today myself and break it down myself as I have for years. Uh, I've, I've presented this material at Teen Challenge for years and years and years and years and years to the men there. And actually, we're, we're teaching through Romans right now. I think I've been doing it for two months, and we're finally hitting chapter three. So, anyway, let's pray. And today we're going to be on Romans 1, 16, and 17. Lord God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this ability to study your word and broadcast it over the internet. And Lord, I pray that your providence and your power would put this material this study into the hands, into the ears of, and the eyes of those who need to see it, and it would bear fruit and for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let's look at Romans 1, 16 and 17. And this is called the thesis statement of the letter to the Romans, or the theme of the letter to the Romans, as various commentaries uh, have it. So there it is up on the screen. If you're watching, up on 17, let's go back to 16. Okay, let's read. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, the ta euangelion. As you can see, if you're watching the Greek, I'm highlighting there, the ta euangelion, the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation. Dunamis gar theu estin eis soterion panti to pestuanti, for it is the power of God, so the gospel is God's power to the salvation of all the believing ones, present active participle, so all those who are believing. It's very important. True faith is always in present tense, usually in the New Testament. Jew first and also the Greek, so to the Jew first and also the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Very important term. And if, you, if you're watching, if you're interested in this stuff, see, this is where I get, you know, there, these are the advanced stuff and then there's a the basic. But if you're learning Greek, notice how Paul can throw a word to the front of a sentence that in English, you know, word order is very important. You, you could, it wouldn't make sense in English to say righteousness for of God in it is being revealed. Uh, Dikaiasune gar theu en auto apocalyptitai. But he throws the term righteousness to the front, so that's the important term. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith for faith. Ek pistuos ice piston. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So there's the text that we're going to look at, the theme text. Now let's break, let's break this down first. So, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. So this idea that Paul would be ashamed of the gospel. Remember, Jesus had several times told his disciples, if you're ashamed of me in this generation, I'll be ashamed of you when I come with the angels. So this does link back to the teachings of Jesus. That there's this temptation to be ashamed. And then there's this temptation to say, well, this message is a foolish message, which is rejected by many people, Jew and Gentile. And if you read the book of Acts and look at Paul's missionary journeys 
and the fact that Paul was going around the Greco-Roman world announcing that the King and Savior and Lord of the universe has come and he was a Jewish peasant boy who was born under suspect circumstances. The claim was that there was no father. He was born of a virgin and that he did miracles, but his ascension to the throne and his procession to his kingship was being marched to Calvary by the Roman authorities and crucified, right? That's not the normal procession that a king would have. And then he resurrected, but he was only seen by a select group of witnesses, and then he was taken up into heaven. I remember Paul Washer has an amazing sermon where he breaks down how this was such a foolish message even back then um, that would be taken about in 1 Corinthians 1. Paul talks about that. So there's much to be ashamed. Um, the other thing that you could, you know, that some commentators talk about is uh, this isn't shame in the sense of embarrassment or something. It's it's Paul was constantly attacked because the message that he preached what seems like it allows for someone to just sin more so that grace may abound. It it seems like the gospel's not enough. Like Paul. You should be ashamed of yourself, man. You're preaching this message that encourages people to be lawless. And we'll see that. And then this word, right? The gospel. Ta euangelion. The gospel. The good news. The royal announcement of good news. And there's been much study uh, by scholars like an N.T. Wright and those type of guys who would, uh, you know, traditionally this is just the, the message of the proclamation of uh, God is holy, we are sinful, and the good news is that God has sent his son Jesus Christ to live and die and rise again. And as we put our faith in him, our sins can be forgiven, we can be reconciled to God, we can be given a status of righteous, and we can be covered in his righteousness, imputed righteousness and all that, which is certainly true. But they, they want to also make the case that in the Greco-Roman world, this, remember, this is a common language, so this would have been spoken in the empire. Uh, euangelion was also a term that had to do with the good news that Caesar proclaimed. And what was the good news that Caesar proclaimed? The gospel of empire. So Caesar is Lord. That, that would have been, so, you know, we have uh, Jesus is Lord is the confession of the Christians. Caesar is Lord is the confession of the Roman empire. And Caesar being Lord means that he has conquered you. You are now part of the empire. Pay your taxes, be a good citizen, and you will have access to the empire. You will have commerce. You will have the, you know, the Romans made the first interstate highway system that was guarded by soldiers. So there would be safe trade and you can, uh, you could, you could come into the good news that Caesar is your Lord and your King. And this political subversion that many scholars believe Paul is, you know, secretly coding in here, not so much secretly, it's pretty open, but you know, using that language of empire that the Romans would have been aware of and subverting it and applying it to this message he's proclaiming. But in this context, it's clear that this gospel is the dunamis theu, the power of God. So this announcement, this good news, is something about the power of God, so God's power. God is the one who works this good news. The good news is something about God coming, God working, God's power and authority. This is what God does for what? Is soterion. There's the word there. So if you, if, you, if you hear that, you've probably heard the term soteriology. It's a study of salvation. That's where we get that from. Soterion is the Greek word there. Soteria is the lexical form, meaning the form you'd look up in the Greek dictionary. And it's salvation unto the believing ones. So let's talk about salvation real quick. So this term is thrown around a lot. And this is an important a side note to just stop a minute and say, what does the term salvation mean? So I'm going to open up my paint program real quick, and I'm going to write some stuff on here if you're watching. So if we have this term, 
salvation, right? So I'm writing it on there, salvation. See, for Paul, this term salvation, okay, is an umbrella term because Paul can use it in three different tenses, right? He can use it in the past tense. So there's text where Paul will say, you have been saved. He can use it in the present tense. There's text where Paul says, we are being saved, present tense. And then, of course, there's text where Paul says, you will be saved, future tense. So salvation is this umbrella term that can refer to past, present, and future, right? And, you know, the, 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 the definition, let's, you know, let's do some of these things while we're doing this. So on Bible works here, I can go down and all these lexicons, let me go back to Bible works for you, all these lexicons down here. Um, so to read on salvation physically as rescue from danger, deliverance, preservation, safety as a religious technical term, safety of the soul in a spiritual sense, salvation. Uh, you know, you have all these deliverance, preservation, safety, salvation, deliverance from the molestation of enemies, preservation of physical life, safety. Uh, so before I get to that, because that's really uh, the term that I prefer when I teach this is just to say rescue from danger. And that's important because in order to get salvation correct, you have to get the danger correct. And that's what Paul's going to do when he starts at verse 18. But back to this. So salvation is a complex of events. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this term, the Ordo. O-R-D-O. Salutis, the order of salvation. So there's three ordos. So this is some systematic theology type stuff. There's the Pactum Salutis, there's the Historia Salutis, and there's the Ordo Salutis. And actually, if we have time, I have to pack so much stuff in, into the, and I don't want to keep make these things super long. But anyway, let's go back to this. Salvation. So the order of salvation, meaning how does God in time apply the work of Christ and this salvation to individuals, right? So we have predestination is the first step. Now, before you go, well, that's Calvinism. Uh, every single Christian believes in some type of predestination. You have to, or else you just deny the Bible because the Bible says predestination. Now, the trick is, what do you mean by that? What's the context of it? How do you understand it? How do you understand these things? And we're not going to get into that right now. That's more Romans 8 and 9. Because uh, Paul doesn't touch on that yet in Romans. You have predestination, right? And then you have calling. Then you have regeneration. Then you have conversion. And conversion has the two twin categories of repentance and faith. I'm writing all this on the whiteboard if you're listening. So you could go and go on the YouTube and if you wanted to see this. So you have predestination calling, regeneration, conversion. Then you have justification, sanctification, And glorification. So I just think this is helpful to start because if you want to study this stuff deeper and study the theology of this, uh, this is classically the way that uh, systematic theologians have broken down the way that God's work in Christ to save us, past, present, and future is applied in each of these categories. And this is just a preview. Paul talks about all these categories in the book of Romans and his, his other writings. So that if that's helpful to you to see that in writing right there. So salvation, let's go back to this. And then let me write this on the, on the Pactum Salutis and the Historia Salutis. So briefly, the Pactum Salutis is the pact or agreement that's the inter-Trinitarian agreement before the universe would even created that the Father would send the Son to accomplish the work of redemption the Holy Spirit would apply the work of Christ to his elect. The pact, this is a 
pre-temporal inter-Trinitarian agreement between the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And then the Historia Salutis are the actual historical events in time where this agreement between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is actually accomplished in time and space and in history. So that would be all the events of redemption. Let me just read this real quick. So I don't know how helpful this is going to be to people. If you can tolerate my um, just free association of how my brain works. But let's read this article real quick. It's up on the screen. I found this article. Let me, let me grab it here so I can. I found this article. It's the IRBS Theological Seminary. I think it's Reformed Baptist. And the title of it is Pactum Salutis, Historia Salutis, Ordo Salutis, and the Ministry. I want to give credit to this. It doesn't have an author to it, I don't think. But let's just read this real quick and define these three salutis. So the Pactum Salutis. Um, Muller defines this as, quote, covenant of redemption. In Reformed Federalism, the pre-temporal intra-Trinitarian agreement of the Father and the Son concerning the covenant of grace and its ratification in and through the work of the Son incarnate. The Son covenants with the Father and the unity of the Godhead to be the temporal sponsor of the Father's testamentum in and through the work of the Mediator. In that work, the Son fulfills his sponsio or fideusio, i.e. his guarantee of payment of the debt of sin in ratification of the Father's testamentum. The roots of this idea of an eternal intra-Trinitarian pactum are clearly present in the late 16th century reform thought, but the contents itself derives from Cosius's theology and stands as his single major contribution to the reform system. Although seemingly speculative, the idea of the pactum salutis is to emphasize the eternal, inviolable, inviolable, how do you say that word? Inviolable and Trinitarian foundation of the temporal uh, foodus gratia. You got Latin here. You got to understand if you, you, you to be a real theologian, you got to be able to read Latin. <laughs> and, and and believe it or not, um, it used to be just a little side issue historical. It used to be to even enter seminary, to even enter it, you had to be able to read Latin and German. And you had to, and then you, to, you had to learn the biblical languages like at a, at a very high level, and it's so it's 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 interesting. Like you had to be able to read Latin to go into a graduate school to get a graduate degree. Like uh, Turretin's works in Latin were the required reading at Princeton back in the in the day when it was a, a premier conservative reformed seminary. Anyway. Uh, okay, the idea of the Pactum Salutis is emphasize the eternal, inviolable, and Trinitarian foundation of the temporal fodis gratiae, much in the way that eternal decree underlines and guarantees the order of Salutis. The covenant of salvation is an important idea. Robert Raymond has called it a theological convention, and to be sure it is, but it does not undermine the truth of the matter taught in the concept. We believe that God is a covenanting God, and even in the relationships of the Trinity, the notion of covenant is present. The interrelationships between the members of the Trinity may be explained economically in terms of covenantal relationships. Now, the Pactum Salutis provides us with the solid basis for our theological inquiry. It is the context for all theological study. Okay, so it, it is this deep understanding of that the Father, Son, and Spirit have made a pact together in, in eternity, as you can see there. Now, Historia Salutis. The Historia Salutis refers to the actual events in space and time by which God brings salvation to his people. Creation, the fall, the flood, the call of Abraham, the exodus, the captivity, the life and death of Christ, Pentecost, all of these are events in, of the Historia Salutis. On the one hand, they are true events of cosmic history. They actually happen in space and time. But in another sense, they bear theological significance because they come in order to fulfill, accomplish the eternal decrees of God. We do not simply speak of abstract decrees of God, but of genuine historical events bearing a great theological significance. We believe that the scriptures record the actual historical events of redemption occurring over several millennia from creation to consummation. The events recorded in scripture, while real events in human history, bring into human history the decrees of God. They give substance and historical reality to these decrees. They provide the basis in space and time of our exegetical studies. Since even the most seemingly mundane parts of Scripture, e.g. The, e the genealogies or some of the Proverbs, come to us through inspired authors writing as representatives of the history of redemption, we give ourselves to exegetical study. But even these events are not the end. The third category concludes the act. 
it was the third category, the Ordo Salutis. The Ordo Salutis refers to the application of the great acts of God in the life of history of the individual believer. Muller again, a term applied to the temporal order of causes and effects through which the salvation of the sinner is accomplished. Because of their emphasis upon the eternal decree and its execution in time, the reform developed the idea of an ordo salutis in detail in the 16th century. So there you go. And then the, it goes on. Um, I could put this link in the uh, episode description if you'd like to read this in full, but it's, it's very good. So um, there we go. So we are... 20 minutes in and I've gotten to uh have gotten to what the um the the the, <laughs> the one two three four five uh we got into salvation but so this is going to tell you how long it's going to take so you know let, let's just continue back to so we have the gospel right the good news this announcement and it's also been said uh, I think I got Michael Horton said this years and years ago and it stuck with me he said the many times in the churches what you'll hear is um, not good news but good advice or some type of self-help proclamation try Jesus give Jesus a try see if he helps you in your life see if he makes your life better uh, in the, in the, the distinction is between the news column and the advice column in the newspaper just kind of a dated reference who, who of my age and younger reads the newspaper, but you know, it used to be hard news, right? Like this is an event that took place and we're just reporting the facts. And then there'd be an opinion column or an advice column. Well, the announcement of Jesus Christ is a fact of history. Jesus Christ has come. He has been, he has come and humbled himself and lived a perfect life of obedience to the father and, and suffered the death that we deserve in obedience to the Father. And because of that obedience, he was resurrected and he is seated in the heavenlies and he is crowned King and Lord. And he commands all men everywhere to submit and bow down to his Lordship. And that's an announcement of an event. It shouldn't be framed as, we'll give this a try, see if it helps your life. No, there is the threat of you either bow the knee to this king and lord, or you will be destroyed by him. He is king and lord. So anyway, the, the, the gospel being the announcement of the ascension of an emperor, right? That's what that news would have meant in the Roman context, political, and Paul's circumventing, co-opting, subverting that, and applying it to Christ. Okay? Now, this gospel is the power of God for salvation. All right, so God's power, and we talked about salvation, the rescue from danger. If you, want, if you want to define that term very simply, rescue from danger. Now, when, when we say rescue, we do mean the same thing today. So if you heard someone say to you, oh, man, it was crazy. There was a fire outside, and, and this house was on fire, and this fireman went in and rescued the person. What you would mean by the use of that word is this person was in danger. They were going to die because of the fire and the smoke and what was going on in the house burning down. That was the danger they were facing, and the firefighter rescued them from that danger. This is a very crucial point to get. Many people will talk about salvation, but when you ask them, well, what are we saved from? They give an incorrect biblical answer. Now, the most common answer you will give of what you're saved from is, I'm saved from my sin, I'm saved from the devil, I'm saved from my choices, I'm saved from this and that and the other thing. But really, what we need to be saved from is God and his just judgment upon us. Because when God is framed as this loving, heavenly father, who has no wrath and has no holiness and is not angry at sin and is not the judge of all the earth, then you don't see God as a danger, right? Many times God is presented as not a dangerous being. He's a harmless being who's just trying to bless and love everyone. Jeremiah 29, 11 theology. I love you and have wonderful plans for you theology. That's what many, many people think. But really the danger and Paul's going to get into it in 118 
he jumps right into, well, this is the danger that we need to be saved from. Our rescue needs to be from what? In 118, the wrath of God. And we'll see that. So salvation is for to be rescued from the danger. And God's power does that, rescues us. But is this rescue for everyone? No. The Bible does not teach universalism. Because right away, look what it says. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who what? Believes. So there's God's side that God's power rescues from this danger we're in. And God alone does that. But our response is to believe. To entrust. Let's see what some of the... um, Let's see what some of the dictionaries say. Relating to what to denote God's existence. Uh, no, no, let's go. Uh, t- 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 huh. Never mind. I don't want to. I don't want to have dead air here trying to find. So what? What this this word connotes trust. So when you believe, it means that you are trusting in something outside of yourself. Faith is the empty hand that receives the gift that God offers in salvation. So the believing one. And then, of course, in Paul's letters, especially in Romans, belief is always the antithesis of works. So there's two ways. As Luther said, there's two types of righteousness. There's the righteousness of works and there's the righteousness of faith. And we'll talk about the term righteousness here in a moment. And then, of course, this salvation that's the power of God that's in the gospel to everyone who believes is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So for Paul, this Jewish-Greek distinction is important, and he points it out. But then he also wants this unity to show that even though this gospel came to the Jews first, and the Jews have privileges, and the Jews have this uh, opportunity to have the word of God and that God reach out to them and the Christ came from them and they have all these privileges, the gospel, this message goes to all, Jew first and also the Greek, to everyone. All right, let's continue. We're 27 minutes in here. For in it, in the gospel, in this proclamation of the gospel, that's the power of God for salvation, everyone who believes, What's revealed in it? The righteousness, the dikaiosune, theu, the righteousness of God is being revealed, apocalyptitai. You can hear in that word the term apocalypse, an unveiling, a revealing. So in this gospel, what is unveiled in, 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 a, in a radical way that God's righteousness is revealed? Now, this term righteousness, okay, let me see if I can erase my whiteboard rule. Let me just introduce this concept briefly. I'm going to keep, I'll, I'll, I'll claim to do things briefly. Oh gosh. And the eraser thing on this is, is so small. It's super annoying. I'm sorry. <laughs> my, I don't have the best setup here. Uh, like Dr. James White, I don't know if you've seen his setup. He's gotten the, they call it the AO Max studio and he's got that st- super sweet like giant size uh, smart screen thing that you can do all kinds of cool stuff with you know it's one day I want to have a studio like that right now I just got my little whole corner in the attic that's why it's called apologetics from the attic some of you who've just found me um, I'm in the third floor of my house um, it's where my wife lets me keep all my theological books and <laughs> at least I have a we got a decent size uh old Victorian house and I have a a corner up here where I can keep all my stuff. Anyway, um, so, (laughs) so what do I, oh yeah, righteousness, righteousness. So righteousness, just briefly. So this is a legal term, judicial term. When you think of the term righteousness in Paul, think of a law court, think of a judge ruling either a verdict, uh, rendering a verdict of guilty or not guilty and the law court and righteousness. And we'll see 
that Paul lays this out in chapter 2 of Romans, very controversial uh, paragraph, actually, Romans 2, 6 to 11. But we're talking about the righteousness of God is revealed in this proclamation. So the law of God to be fulfilled has two requirements. The first requirement is that it must be obeyed, obviously. So if you want to be considered righteous in the law court and not guilty, you obey the law. So if you got dragged before a judge right now for committing murder, but you didn't actually commit murder, you were charged with it, but you didn't actually commit it, and you've actually obeyed the law to not murder, then you would be righteous as far as the law is concerned and not be liable to wrath or punishment because you kept that law. But if you break that law, then you are now, you're not righteous now. You've, you've, you've been found guilty of breaking the law. Now, there's another thing that the law demands in order to fulfill its requirements, and that's punishment. So this other idea of, well, if you break the law, the law can be satisfied. And, you know, we say it in our society, you do the crime, you do the time. Our system of laws is set up where there are, when disobedience happens, there are appropriate punishments um, doled out by the legal system. It's the same thing in the kingdom of God in his courtroom. There is a punishment to be borne. Now, in an earthly sense, right, if I get a speeding ticket, then my punishment, I disobey the law, my punishment is to pay a fine or maybe lose my license. But as you go up the ladder of seriousness of the law, you know, you have misdemeanors and you have felonies. When you get up into the felony range, well, now the punishments become more extreme, up to and including life in prison and even the death penalty. Well, when you get into God's commandments and the being you're sinning against is an eternal being who is your creator, who gives you every breath in your, in your lungs and every heartbeat, when you sin against him, well, the punishment becomes an eternal punishment. But all that to say this, what Paul is saying here is that in this gospel proclamation, there is a righteousness, and Paul will say in 321, it's a righteousness that's apart from law, meaning, back to what Luther said, the two kinds of righteousness. We have the law, and there's two ways to do it. Either you, here's you, you can attempt by your own obedience to satisfy the demands of God's law. So the way I frame it a lot when I teach and preach this is I say, look, if you died right now and stood before God, I'll give you a very easy way for you to get into heaven. And that's kind of provocative, the way to put it. And people go, oh, okay, an easy way, let me hear it. Okay. Stand before God and say, God, I have obeyed your commandments perfectly. I have never sinned. I have always honored you and loved you and served you with my whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. I have loved our neighbor as myself flawlessly for every second of every day. Therefore, I deserve heaven because I am presenting to you a righteousness that I have constructed by my works and my obedience. So prove that to God on the day of judgment. And most people, unless they're insane, there's a part of them in their conscience that goes, um, that's not going to work. I mean, even if like a small child can understand the simple concept of you have to be perfect to get into heaven. And unless they have someone who's, I mean, I've had this before in Sunday school classes over the years. I've taught, well, my mommy says that I'm a perfect little angel. She's like, oh gosh, <laughs> this is, <laughs> so, you know, please don't raise your children to believe they're perfect little angels. Uh, raise your children to understand the biblical doctrine of original sin and that they're born sinners and they need a savior and they need Jesus. Anyway. So there's that way of righteousness, but what the gospel reveals, okay, and we'll just, this is just previews, highlights to put the gospel in here in a very clear form for those who maybe only hear this session and don't, don't uh, listen to or watch the rest of our study. What Paul is proclaiming is there is a righteousness that comes from God. So here's you, if there's a righteousness that comes from you, that's you obeying the law and trying to obey it. The righteousness that comes from God, okay, so there's a righteousness that God has, and that righteousness is what? Jesus. Jesus 
is made incarnate. Oh, what did I do? Sorry, I messed up. There you go. Jesus is incarnate, and in his life and death and resurrection, Jesus comes in and he obeys the law. So he is the only man, now he's the God man, but he's the only man who's ever lived, who's been born of a woman, who can say to God the Father, what I said earlier, you have to say. He's the only one that can say, I'm a perfect man, I've obeyed God perfectly, and I deserve heaven. And he can say that, and it's true, because he did because he's the sinless son of God. And if you really meditate upon that for a moment, that what would it mean to live 33 years of your life and never sin, not only never sin, never give into temptation, but also perfectly obey everything God wanted you to do every moment of your life. Every thought you had, every word you spoke, every deed you did was perfectly in line with God's intentions for your life perfectly aligned with his law. Unbelievable. Then, of course, what's the second thing Jesus did in his work? And if you want the technical terms, this is called the active obedience of Christ, where he actively obeys the law, and then the passive obedience of Christ, where he suffers the punishment that we deserve on the cross. So, remember, and this is a controversial doctrine as well. There's books written against it, and people call it cosmic child abuse and all this stuff. But this is where Jesus Christ actually suffered the punishment in our place, took the curse, suffered the wrath, was made liable to judgment in our place. So that the law is fulfilled also in the sense that God doesn't just let us go. He actually punishes a substitute in our place. And the whole sacrificial system of the Old Testament teaches this, that a substitute animal is placed on the altar instead of the sinner. And the wrath of God is poured out upon that animal. And that is simply a foreshadowing of coming of Christ. Okay. So that's righteousness. And it's a righteousness that's revealed. And it's by faith. And then, of course, this clause uh, revealed from faith to faith. Uh, you know, in the Greek, if you're if you're interested, I'm, I'm highlighting. Oh, let me go back to Bible works. I'm sorry. Uh, ek pistios ice piston. It's very difficult to translate, and many scholars will tell you that. Um, so I like the NIV on this. It's a righteousness that's by faith from first to last. Now, the term first and last doesn't occur in the Greek, so that's a, that's a translation that's not literal. Um, but I think it, uh, unless New, New Living Translation is helpful to look at, see how they did. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. So... It's not like it starts out by faith and then it ends in works. No, this righteousness that you have that makes you right with God, which declares you to be not guilty, declares you to be worthy of eternal life, is not because of your worthiness. It's not because you suffered the punishment. It's because your substitute did. And what is faith? Faith is clinging to your substitute. Faith is saying to God, God, I know I'm unworthy. I know that I haven't obeyed your law. I know I deserve punishment, but I'm trusting in my substitute. I'm trusting in the one who obeyed in my place and suffered in my place. And I'm getting in on his coattails. To use a, a, a term that people use sometimes. I'm getting in because of what he did. I'm getting in because of the righteousness that you provided through him. Right? And then... Paul quotes Habakkuk, but the righteous man shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And he quotes that. All right. So 40 minutes in. So I have some time. So if you want to tune out at this part, and that's just my exposition of this. But now I want to look at some commentaries with my book cam. And I want to show you a few things. And the first thing I'll show you... Now, let me, let me make a statement first. Fundamentalism, in its worst form, is the idea that you cannot glean any benefit 
from any writing or denomination other than your own and the people that share your presuppositions. So, for example, there are many people who will probably listen to this that will say, for example, the first thing I want to look at, Luke Timothy Johnson. Let me get my book cam open here. Luke Timothy Johnson, the writings of the New Testament. Guess what Luke Timothy Johnson is? Da, 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 he's a Roman Catholic. Now, the fundamentalist instinct would be, this is a corrupted book. You can't even get anything good out of it. But what good education does for you is it teaches you how to go into things like this and find the good content, the good scholarly research, and to critically engage with the things that you think are wrong. Okay? We're also going to look at N.T. Wright. Okay? If you even, in some circles, say that name, you will be immediately suspect. So how are we able to do that? I just want to, so, so caution. I'm going to be reading from some things that some people may tune me out, but I, I, I plead with you to challenge yourself on that mentality that you can't go into other writers, scholars outside of your narrow circle to learn about the word of God. Now, I thought this was cool. This is just an overall point. He This is in his section on Romans, and he talks about how Romans is in the format of what is called a scholastic diatribe. So that, that's what he says, but I want to skip here. So it's still in that same section. So I want to read this part. I think this is pretty cool. And then how he applies it to the Romans. So here it is. Paul's teaching within his school of delegates and fellow workers. The diatribe is not a formless rant, but a structured form of argument with the following features. One. A statement of the thesis. So here's an example. Every good person is free. Two, a demonstration by means of antithesis. Vice leads to slavery. Three, a restatement of the thesis. Four, a demonstration of the thesis by example. Example, Her Heracles was free because of his virtue even though he was a slave. Five, an exposition of the thesis. Six, an answering of objections to the thesis. E.g. to the objection, are there not virtuous people who are prisoners the components are not always found together but they are combined often enough to to support the suggestion that romans is such a scholastic argument worked out by the pauline school and sent to the roman church as a commendation of paul's gospel the pattern of argumentation also provides a key to reading romans paul states his thesis in 116 and 17 which we just read so this is the thesis of the letter according to luke timothy johnson it falls immediately with this antithesis in 118 to 320. He then restates the thesis in 321 to 31 and demonstrates it by example in 4, 1 to 25 before completing his exposition in 5, 1 to 21. Objections to the thesis are raised as early as 3, 1 through 8 but are not picked up and answered systematically until 6, 1 to 11, 3. So that's pretty cool, right? I thought that was really an interesting thing to think about. And then if you look here, he starts to go through, sorry, my camera has to focus. I haven't figured out how to, but anyway, Romans 1 through 11, and then he goes, the announcement of the thesis, and then he talks about the antithesis. So I thought that was pretty cool. That's a cool structure to, to think about. Sorry, it's hard to, I don't have enough room for my books here. So next one I want to look at is N.T. Wright. And I'm just doing this to fill the time. And I'm, we're at 45 minutes now. I don't want to go past an hour. So we have N.T. Wright here. So I want to show you a couple things from his. So let's start with the Habakkuk passage because this is where N.T. Wright is, is a beast. This is where he is like better than, than a lot of people you'll find. Let me see if I can... Um, can you see? Yeah, that's, 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 it's just got it takes a minute to focus. So like Habakkuk, right? So the way he, back to the text that we were on, right? The, how he quotes it, it goes, for as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. Now, 
if, if you look at that on the surface, you're kind of like, well, what is Paul? Actually, N.T. Wright gives that. Let's, let's read that. He says, what do some scholars kind of end up saying about why does Paul quote this verse? What's the point? And you know, many times you'll read, in, even, even in the Gospels and in, in Paul, you'll read this little quote and you'll be like, what the heck? It's like, that doesn't even make any sense. And, and you try to figure out why is Paul quoting that. So here, um, where is it? Oh, he starts down here. Paul finishes a summary statement by quoting Habakkuk 2.4, The righteous shall live by faith. This innocent-looking quotation has generated enormous discussions. These have to do with the apparent shifts in meaning between the original Hebrew text, The righteous shall live by his faithfulness. Oh, let's wait for it to focus here. There we go. Um, the Septuagint, so for you newcomer, LXX is the is shorthand for the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. So the Hebrew was translated into Greek. And that's the text that the apostles quote from and the gospel writers. So the Septuagint says, the righteous shall live by my faithfulness. So there's a shift, there's a, there's a difference, a serious difference between the Hebrew and the Greek in Habakkuk 2.4. And then it says in Paul's own quotation, the righteous shall live by faithfulness. And also with two particular questions, does by faith modify live or righteous? And where therefore does the emphasis fall? The righteous shall live by faith or the one who by faith is righteous shall have life. And how does Paul intend the quotation to support what has gone before? All these matters obviously interlock. Okay. Now this is, so we, let's continue. We should avoid a minimalist solution on the last question. Some have suggested that Paul merely ransacked his mental concordance for passages in which righteousness and faith occurred side by side, came up with this passage in Genesis 15, 6, and proceeded to quote them in Romans 1 and 4 and in Galatians 3, without regard for their original context and meaning. His general use of scripture, and in particular the sense of the passage in Galatians 3, indicate otherwise. We need to imp we need to inquire as to the wider context of the original sentence and the echoes Paul may have intended to alert readers to hear. And um, an important work, and I have that book, is called Echoes, in, Echoes of Scripture in the Letters of Paul by Richard Hayes. A very important uh, work, scholarly work, where he goes into what he calls the echoes of Scripture and how when Paul quotes a small piece of a Scripture, he has the whole context in mind. Now, here's where N.T. Wright is a total beast, where how he's able to tie together the original context of the quote. So check this out. The original passage in Habakkuk belongs within a book full of woe and puzzlement. The, Ch the Chaldeans are marching against Israel. All seems lost. What is Israel's God up to in allowing it? This is once more the question of the righteousness or justice of God. This alone should warn us off the idea that Paul was quoting at random a verse that merely happened to contain his two catchwords. By way of answer, the prophet is given a vision, but this is a vision for the future to be revealed at a later date, Habakkuk 2.3. At the moment, God's true people, the righteous within a sinful nation, will live by faith. Faith here, whether the, it's human faith as in the Hebrew text, or God's faithfulness, as in the Septuagint, is the key feature of the interim period. What does this mean in practice for the prophet? It means believing that God will eventually punish the idolatrous and violent nation, that God will remember mercy in the midst of wrath, and bring salvation to Israel, 3.2-19. The thematic parallel with Romans 118 to 320 and 321 to 425 is striking and continues to suggest that Paul does indeed have the larger context from Habakkuk in mind. Faced with the pagan idolatry and arrogance, the devout first century Jew longed for God's righteousness to break forth, bringing wrath on the nations and salvation for Israel. Paul, however, has seen God's purpose unveiled in the gospel and believes, like the prophet, that this vision is the key to understanding all that will now take place. The solution to the problem of first century Israel produces a second order problem. Much of ethnic Israel is failing to believe the gospel, while Gentiles are coming in in droves. Paul will deal with that in due course. For the moment, he can contents himself 
with the cryptic but evocative quotation, He is not ashamed of the gospel because it is God's power to salvation for all believers, because faced with a world in idolatry and ruin, God's righteousness is revealed in the gospel, a matter of divine faithfulness reaching down and calling out the response of human faithfulness in the setting I'm sorry, I can't see it. In this setting, the righteous shall live by faith, faithfulness, whether divine or human or both, Paul does not need to say. The sentence remains cryptic until we reach 321 to 425. I think that's pretty cool. I don't agree with N.T. Wright on how he ends up coming down on the doctrine of justification, but you got to respect when he goes in and is able to connect the Old Testament narrative and the, the, the flow of the, the, the history of redemption to something like that. All right. And this is just for those who want to get into deeper theological study. Let's, all right, we got, what do we got? I got nine minutes. <coughs> Ernst Kaseman, a very important German scholar. Let's see what he says. On Romans 1 16 and 17 just to give you a just, just to give you a taste of some of this stuff oh you know what I want to read right one more time let me go back to right real quick I want you to see what he said what he says about when it says uh, the gospel is the power of God what he says about how that connects to the political. Uh, where'd it go? There it is. 116. I thought this one was cool. Where are we? 116. Just as King Herod looms over much of the gospel narrative, so also Caesar, the Roman emperor, looms unmentioned over several passages in Paul's works. Caesar was the current lord of the world, whose position was, by implication, challenged and threatened by the Jewish Messiah, who claimed the same role. To come to Rome with the gospel of Jesus, to announce someone else's accession to the world's throne, therefore, was to put on a red coat and walk into a field with a potentially angry bull. This proposal might seem to be in tension with 13, to 7, but see the commentary there. It's talking about submit yourself to the governing authority. So I just thought that, you know, that's an example of seeing the political ramifications of the proclamation of the gospel that Jesus is Lord. Uh, so actually, let's take a look at, um, before we get to Kazem, we don't have time to get to him, but Haldane, let's, let's, let's I thought Haldane had a cool thing about Romans 1.16 about the power of God. So this is Haldane. Haldane is great. I love this commentary. So, for it is the power of God to salvation. I'm sorry, let me zoom this in a little. There we go, that's better. For it is the power of God to salvation. Here the apostle gives the reason why he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The gospel is the great and admirable mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hidden God into which the angels desire to look whereby his manifold wisdom is made known unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. It is the efficacious means by which God saves men from sin and misery and bestows on them eternal life, the instrument by which he triumphs in their hearts and destroys in them the dominion of Satan. The gospel, which is the word of God, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. By it, as the word of truth, men are begotten by the will of God. James 1.18, 1 Peter 1.23. And through faith in the gospel, they are kept by his power unto salvation, 1 Peter 1, 5. The exceeding greatness of the power of God exerted in the gospel toward those who believe is compared to his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand, Ephesians 1, 19. Thus, while the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, to those who are saved it is the power of God. Now, that's an amazing paragraph, weaving together all kinds of scripture references to say, about the power of God and his salvation. Absolutely incredible. I thought that was really, really good. 
how much more time we got. We got six minutes, five minutes. And then you got Mu on Romans 1, 16. And he also calls this part the theme of the letter. I think he calls it, yes, the theme of the letter. Uh, where was it at? So here's Mu, the theme of the letter. These theologically dense verses are made up of four subordinate clauses, each supporting or illuminating the one before it. Paul's pride in the gospel, verse 16a, is the reason why he is so eager to preach the gospel in Rome, verse 15. This pride, in turn, stems from the fact that the gospel contains or mediates God's saving power for everyone who believes, verse 16b. Why the gospel brings salvation is explained in 17a. It manifests God's righteousness. A righteousness based on faith, verse 17b finally provides scriptural confirmation for this connection between righteousness and faith. And then he goes on. And then let's look at uh, MacArthur real quick. I thought, oh, crap, I lost the page, sorry. Uh, 116. I thought MacArthur had a good little summary statement as well. So this is MacArthur. After, after having gained the attention of his readers by explaining the purpose of his writing and then introducing himself, 1, 1 to 15, Paul now states the thesis of his epistle. Uh, his epistle. These two verses express the theme of the book of Romans, and they contain the most life-transforming truth God has put into men's hands. To understand and positively respond to this truth is to have one's time and eternity completely altered. These words summarize the gospel of Jesus Christ, which Paul then proceeds to unfold and explain throughout the remainder of this epistle. For that reason, our comments here will be somewhat brief and more detailed discussion of these themes will come later in, the, in this study. So, as you study the commentaries, they all agree on this. That that one sixteen and 17 uh, really is the thesis, the summary statement of the epistle. <coughs> so, and, and it's, it's very difficult. Like, I still have seven or eight commentaries behind me that I haven't even uh, shown you. So I'm trying to, I hope this, I hope this struck a good balance. The first half, I just tried to be very simple and distill the, the practical teaching of what is righteousness and what's the gospel, what's faith. And then we hit some of these commentaries, some more high level uh, issues and, and looked at it. So hopefully this is helpful to some people. And I want this to uh, be some content that uh, you can throw in your podcast on your drive to work or, or wherever and, and get some get some value out of it. And of course, I'm still going to continue... Uh, the, it hasn't struck me yet to to do an episode on current events or respond to somebody's false teaching or uh, defend the Christian faith in any uh, way in the, in the in the issues that are going on. But I'm sure that'll happen soon. But in the meantime, let's just keep walking through the Book of Romans. So next time we will start on Romans one eighteen, and we will start to slowly walk through how Paul paints the dilemma that we're in as to why we need the righteousness of God. And he sets out to strip all forms of righteousness that someone might hide behind to think that they are worthy of eternal life through their works and that they have some kind of special privilege or special reason why God would accept them. And Paul has to level the playing field and say, there's no one righteous. All have sinned. Nobody is worthy everyone is in need of this righteousness that God provides through faith in Christ because you won't see your need for the righteousness of God till you are emptied of your own righteousness and we'll see that so thanks for joining me today on apologize from the attic thank you subscribe uh, share this content if it's helpful to you and we'll see you next time God bless